Welcome to the Top Order podcast. So we've had a few listeners comment lately that we chat a lot about bowling and particularly spin bowling for a podcast called The Top Order. So all those people today are in for a real treat with over 6,000 test runs, 5,000 ODI runs and a whopping 22,000 first class runs at an average of over 50. Our next guest piled on the runs at every level and all around the world to become one of the best Australian batsmen in the modern era. He's won the World Cup, the IPL, and is now a coach and commentator. We could talk about his achievements for days, so it's time for us to stop talking and say, Mike Cussie, welcome to the Top Water Podcast. Yeah, thanks very much for having me, guys. Uh, I, I, no, I was a bit nervous about it. I didn't think a, uh, a New Zealand show would have an Australian on, on but um, no, I'm looking forward to the chat. should be fun. No, look, um, absolutely. Our, yeah, our dream, we've got an Australian Michael in the, in the blue T-shirt there. Um, I have to admit, as a as a youngster growing up in the UK, I really loved Australian cricket. I actually played a season of grade cricket in Brisbane when I was 19. I came back with uh, several pairs of Oakleys and, a, and an Aussie twang. Um, and yeah, kind of wanted to be Ian Healy for, for a little while, um, until 05 at least. And I'm sure we'll come on to that. But look, for, for you, let's start at the start. Was being an international cricketer always your dream when you were growing up? Take us into your back yard as well because you you and your brother Dave must have had some uh, some epic battles <laughs> yeah without doubt um, both my brother Dave and I we, we had the dream of playing for Australia one day um, and I think that's probably where we learn our competitive spirit in the backyard I think if there was a, a spirit of cricket back in those days we would have been banned for life uh, there <laughs> was uh, there was punch-ups there was cheating there was bribery um, there was swearing there, there was all kinds of things going on in the backyard there, but, um, yeah, we did have some good, good battles along the way. I think when we were growing up, it was either Australia versus England or the West Indies were, were big in Australia as well, coming through world series cup. And, uh, so trying to emulate our heroes, um, you know, was, was fantastic in the backyard. My heroes were Alan Border and, and Dennis Lilly, Rodney Marsh. And then, um, as we got a bit older, you know, then, you know, the likes of Merv Hughes and, and, um, and um, Craig McDermott and, and these guys sort of uh, really sort of took over. So it was, uh, yeah, great memories, um, but certainly a few bruises along the way as well. And who was the match referee? <laughs> yeah, that was the thing. We didn't have one. It was probably me in the end. Most of our backyard games ended up with me chasing my brother Dave around the backyard uh, trying to catch him and beat him up and he'd lock himself in the car. So I couldn't really get him in the, in the end. But um, yeah, mum used to just, she used to try and mediate, but um, yeah, she was more interested in uh, just getting us outside to play. And you mentioned Alan Border there. We've got a story. We, we want to know whether it's true or not, but you were playing, I think, for Australia A. And uh, AB joked to you to get match practice by staying in the nets for six hours. Did you actually go and do that and have a, a six hour net? Yeah, that's true. Um, I can probably go back a step further than that. Um, AB had a huge influence on my career in the end. Uh, I, obviously, he was my hero growing up. And in fact, up to the, about the age of eight years uh, eight years old, I was actually a right-hander. But I, I loved AB that much that I turned around about left-handed to be like AB. And uh, don't, don't get me wrong, there was a few times throughout my career when I was in huge form slumps that I thought I'd done the wrong thing and I'd better change back. But... Um, yeah, uh, you, you, the, the story you're referring to, we were on an Australia A tour in Scotland and um, it was the day before a game. AB was the coach and I, I was uh, in the team and um, uh, the day before we were having a net session and, and the bowlers were just sort of rolling their arm over just for probably 10, 15 minutes. The batters would have about a five, 10 minute hit in the nets and AB being his uh, you know old school self just pulled the group together and said, you know, how do you guys expect to bowl 30 overs in a day when you when you bowl for 10 minutes in the net? And you batsmen, how do you expect to learn to bat all day when you're only spending 10, 15 minutes in the nets? It's not good enough, you know. And it did it did hit home a little bit, to be honest. And and uh, I came back to Australia and um, I was playing club, uh, club cricket and my, my club team had a bye. And so I, I said to my batting coach, I said, right, come on, let's go and learn how to bat all day. And um, we, we turned up at a... Uh, started our session at 11 o'clock uh, in an indoor centre at Wanneroo, my, my local club team. And uh, um, we did sort of a whole range of uh, underarm drills and throwdowns and bowling machine. We went from 11 to 1, had a lunch break for 40 minutes. And then we went from 1.40 through to 3.40, had a tea break and then powered on, uh, you know, to bat all day. And uh, yeah, it was a exhausting exercise. Obviously, you're facing a lot more balls uh, in quick succession there when you're facing the bowling machine and throws and things like that. But um yeah, it was a good exercise in, in learning how to go through the 
the peaks and troughs in batting in a long innings. You're always going to go through uh, times where, you know, the, the scoring ebbs and flows and your concentration ebbs and flows. And so I sort of got a lot out of it. But, um, yeah, it's a bit embarrassing when I talk about it now. Do you see that now in the test game? I guess a lot of games going not quite the distance and, and that ebb and flow seems to be lost a little bit. There's not too many guys that grind it out for as long anymore. Is is that indicative of the impact of T20, do you think? I, I agree. I think T20's had a huge impact uh, on that side of it. Um, you know, the players are scoring so much more quickly than certainly when I was coming through and, and trying to set games up as quickly as they possibly can, giving the bowlers more time to bowl opposition teams out. Uh, certainly my game and when I was coming through um, it was based around patience and batting long periods of time and wearing the bowlers down whereas certainly with a lot of players um, you know that 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 philosophy seems to have changed I I still think there's a place for in the game and I think you know watching a couple of the the younger England players at the moment playing test cricket are certainly looking to bat more time and and uh, you know you do have five days in test cricket and uh, so you know I, I still believe that guys with good technique and good patience and discipline um, can have a good impact in Test match cricket. So we'll go back a little bit to your introduction to state cricket. Um, firstly, I guess, David played for Victoria and, and you obviously WA. What's the story there? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit embarrassing from a Western Australian perspective. I, I'd been in the Sheffield Shield team for a couple of years and my brother, two years younger, uh, he, he was doing quite well in, in club cricket, um, played the odd second 11 game here or there and was sort of knocking on the door of the state team. We had a very strong state team at that stage. Uh, it was hard for anyone to break into the team. Um, and, and there was a stage where I'd come back from Sheffield Shield cricket and, and I had a run of three games of club cricket with my brother. And um, uh, I scored a 21 week, 30 the next week and then a 40 in the third week. And my brother scored 100, 100, 100 over the three weeks. And the uh, not the national the uh, the state selector was coming down to the uh, to the games and and he he after the third game he he pulled my brother aside and said you know look I know you're um, keen to get into the state team but you know these twenties and thirties and forties that you're making aren't good enough you've got to be scoring hundreds like your brother's been doing and uh, obviously it was Dave making the runs and not me uh, and so the selector and so my brother thought well. You know, they're not even really noticing what I'm doing. Um, it's a tough team to get into. So he decided to to move over to Victoria and, and work his way into the Victorian team and ended up having a fantastic first-class career himself. Yeah, it must have been. Does he feel unlucky not to have played a, a test given his first-class average and, and all the runs he scored? Well, I think he's unlucky, personally. You know, yeah. he scored so many first-class runs and, and scored some in, in some really difficult situations as well. Um, again, I guess the era that you know he was coming through, it was a very difficult team to break into because because it was a strong Australian team and not many opportunities came up. Uh, he, he did play a fair few uh, one day games and T20 games for Australia, which is probably more suited. His technique probably wasn't as strong, um, you know, or as suited to Test match cricket. But but I still believe, due to his first class uh, record, that he could have he could have certainly uh, had some success. Yeah. So look, we'll go back to your intro into that state side. You mentioned it was a tough, um, a tough side to get into the WA side. Very strong shield at that point. Was it intimidating walking into that dressing room as a nineteen-year-old? Any initiation ceremonies that you you can remember? <laughs> yeah, I remember it vividly, actually. Uh, well, I, as a teenager, I used to love going down to the Wacker and watching, um, you know, the, the Western Australian team play, and and. Literally a couple of years later, I was in the same dressing room with these guys. And, and the first time I was in there, I was named 12th man. And obviously, we all know that the role of the 12th man is to, to race around and help everyone out, get their, get their uh, drinks and food if they want it, and uh, you know, just do all those horrible jobs that no one really wants to do. And Tom Moody was a senior player in the team, and he, he was struggling with a back injury. And he called me over and he said, Huss, um, I've got to take these two pills. And I said, yep, no worries. Do you want Powerade, Gatorade, water? What do you, what do you want to wash them down? He goes, no, 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 um, they're suppositories. And uh, I just need you to, uh, you know, just uh, pop, them, pop them up the, uh, the back, <laughs> back end. And, uh, and I didn't really know what to expect. I, I didn't really even know what a suppository was at that stage. And uh, I, I turned to Justin Langer, who, who's a bit of a hero of mine as well, who was standing next to Tom, to look for a little bit of a, you know, I think this has got to be a joke, right? And Justin Lang has got these steely eyes, you know, that just look straight through you. And, and he just said, mate, you're the bloody 12th man. You, know, you get in there and you help your teammate out. You know, that's your job in the team. And so now I'm starting to 
you know, sweat and uh, get a little bit worried. And so I, I turn the other way and I look at the coach. There's a guy called Daryl Foster, who, who is honestly one of the kindest, most gentle guys you could ever meet in your entire life. And uh, I was hoping to get a little bit of a support from him. And he just looked at me and said, well, you know, I'm sorry, Huss, you know, you are the 12th man. You, you, you're you going to have to, you know, help your teammate out in any way you possibly can. So Tom, he took me by the hand. And he started walking me towards the uh, the toilet area. And thankfully, everyone burst out laughing and I didn't have to go through with the deed. But uh, <laughs> it was a bit of a tough initiation. And uh, I can honestly say I was never 12th man for Western Australia ever again. Well, and, and did you uh, return the prank on, on any sort of uh, <laughs> wide-eyed youngsters? <laughs> no, not really. Um, I, I, it was a really tough, tough uh, time to come into the team. But a lot of those guys were old school um, and really made it difficult for any young players coming in. That they wanted to make sure that you earned your stripes. They wanted to make sure that you, you know, didn't take anything for granted. That you you had to earn their respect in the team. And uh, they were very hard on us. And it's not what I needed at that stage. So I must admit, I found it quite tough in my first couple of years for Western Australia. And I kind of made a pact with myself that when I became a senior player, I was never going to make a younger player feel, um, you know, like that when they sort of came into the team. And uh, I guess the only prank I really pl played on someone was uh, a guy called Hilton Cartwright, who's played, a, I think, one or two test matches for Australia. Uh, um, he, he was playing his very first match for WA, and I was captain of the team. And I had to, at the end of the game, I had to go and do the umpire's report and, and uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I came back in, into the dressing room, and everyone had packed up their kits, and, and mine, I hadn't had an opportunity to pack all mine up. And I yelled at Hilton Cartwright, said, Hilt, what the hell is going on here? And he sort of didn't know where to look or what, what, to, what to do. And I said, mate, my kit hasn't been packed up. What, what, what the hell's going on? But um, I, couldn't, I couldn't, you know, hold the joke for very long. And I burst out laughing and, uh, you know, as did everyone else in the dressing room. Look, I guess there's a lot said about that era of Australian cricket. And, you know, certainly as an Englishman at that stage, that Sheffield Shield and the, and the depth of it was really made out to be something that obviously provided you guys with an awesome side for, for a long period of time. How would you compare county cricket to the Shield in, in those days? I guess a little bit of a, a view that county cricket's a bit soft and you've had the opportunity to play both competitions. What, what do you think about that sort of comparison? Well, I, I played a lot of county cricket and I absolutely loved it. Uh, I think it was instrumental in helping me improve as a player, just, just literally batting every single day. Um, my, my game just improved immeasurably um, and particularly I was quite fortunate I played at Northamptonshire for my first three seasons and coming from the Wacker where it's all pace and bounce um, cuts and pulls going to Northamptonshire where it was all about spin we had three fantastic spinners in Graham Swan, um, Monty Panisar and, and Jason Brown who's in my view arguably you know the best of all three he was a fantastic bowler so Getting to face those guys at training, watching them bowl in the games, learning to play against spin was was fantastic. Uh, I guess the biggest difference I found in county cricket was just the, the intensity level. Because you're playing, you know, six days a week, um, it's very difficult to play at 100% intensity. You have to drop your intensity down a little bit just to physically and mentally get through. Uh, whereas in Sheffield Shield cricket at that time, we were literally playing a game, you know, for in one week and then we'd have a week break and then we'd come back and we'd play another game and then we'd have a week break. And and so you could really build yourself up for a game and just go, you know, you had to go as hard as you could for four days, give 100% intensity. And um, so so that's probably the biggest difference I, I found. I, I, I would have thought that I, I felt as though that the, the, um, the ability of the players was probably very similar um, in the two countries, but it was just a slight difference in intensity of the games. And talking about that intensity, I guess the Australian batting lineup at that era was was sensational. That you know the likes of the the War Brothers, the Langers, the Haydens, etc. It took you a while to crack into that side. How did you sort of feel through that period? Did you ever give up on your dream? Did you ever sort of you know start getting your resume ready for for life after cricket? <laughs> well, it was a it was a great learning experience to be honest, because because my first probably three or four seasons for Western Australia were, were very good. And, and I, I felt as though I was really close to getting a game. But as you mentioned, the, the team was so strong. I, I was an opening batsman for, for 10 years of my first class career. And we had Mark Taylor and uh, Michael Slater making heaps of runs. And so an opportunity never came up. And then after they sort of, you know, passed on the baton to, you know, like a Matthew Hayden, um, you know, he, he obviously is a fantastic player as well. And then 
Justin Langer came in and, and, you know, he did so well and they forged a great opening partnership and, and virtually never missed a game for five years. So it was really difficult to get an opportunity. But as I said, um, my, my game was sort of based around patience and discipline and batting long periods of time. And after that first three or four seasons, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, what do I need to do to take that next step to just jump up another level? And I had a good look at the Australian team at the time. And, and you know, there was... Uh, sorry, there was uh, Hayden, there was Ponting, there was Gilchrist, and even Langer, who who was a bit of a nuggety sort of player, turned himself into a, more of an aggressive opening batsman as well. And I thought, OK, well, that's what the national selectors want. They want aggressive attacking players. They want the scoring rates to be quicker. And so I decided to change my game a bit and, and become more aggressive and try and put the pressure back on the bowlers and play more shots. And, of course, it had a detrimental effect on my performance, and I started becoming really inconsistent and I actually got dropped from the WA team at the end of one season uh, for the last Sheffield Shield game of the season against Victoria. And it was a devastating blow. And at the end of that season, I really tried to reflect and I thought, well, you know what? My dream of playing for Australia is over, really. Let, let's just not worry about it. Let's just go back to playing my way, enjoying the game, enjoy playing for Western Australia, enjoy my teammates. And no, I could still be proud of my career if I got, you know, could play for a decade for Western Australia in first class cricket. And it's funny, as, as soon as I made that mental shift um, and, and I guess the technical sort of shift, my consistency returned straight away. I started playing really well. Uh, and then that, that's how, I, and then I eventually sort of got picked for Australia after that. So it was, it was a great lesson in figuring out how I play my best cricket and, and just sticking to it through thick and thin. And, and then you just got to hope that, and, and pray that an opportunity comes up. And you, and you did get an opportunity finally to play for Australia, but in the white ball format, in the yellow shirt rather than the cream. Do you, how did you feel when you got that call up? And, and, and how did you, do you remember how you got the news? Uh, I don't remember how I got the news. I, I think I was quite lucky to get an opportunity because um, I think Ricky Ponting was having a rest before the finals and Michael Bevan might have been injured. And uh, I, I'd been batting in the middle order for Western Australia in one-day cricket, which, you know... Uh, to be honest, I, I was lucky to get an opportunity there. I, the only way I got an opportunity for WA, because um, again, I was opening the batting in one day cricket and I, and I wasn't very good at all. I was struggling big time. So I got dropped out of the team. But what used to happen in the old days, we played a Sheffield Shield game for four days and then they used to tack a one day on the, on the end. And we, we played this four day game at the MCG. And on the Sunday, it was going to be the one day. And I wasn't selected in the team. I was due to fly home. But um, in the last day of the Shield game, Damien Martin hurt his back and Simon Kadic became quite sick. So they said, right, well, you can stay and you just, just drop down and combat number seven, you know, um, you know just, just fill a hole in, in the team. And f uh, as, as luck has it, um, we were in all kinds of trouble. I think we were five for 30 or five for 40 when I came in and I managed to get a score and then we ended up winning the game. So I was lucky enough to keep my place in the middle order and, and sort of play kind of like a Michael Bevan role, although he was he was the best in the world at it. And, and if, I thought if I could just play half as good as what he did, then then I'd still be doing pretty well and help WA. And, and so I was lucky to get an opportunity there in the middle order. And and, and thankfully, um, it, it worked out OK. So when a couple of those guys, you know, Ricky was uh, having a rest and Michael Bevan was injured, there was an opportunity there. And uh, I, yeah, I, was, I was, I guess, in the right place at the right time. It was a fantastic experience. I loved it. My first game for Australia at my home ground at the Wacker. Um, I was exhausted before the game even started because I'd played the game and my innings uh, a million times in my head beforehand. And but but honestly, the 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 roar um, when I came out to bat, um, you know, from the local crowd was just incredible. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll savor those sort of uh, memories forever. Were you the kind of guy that that prepared by playing the whole game through in your head and thought about everything and did all that kind of scenario planning and did? that change as your career went on? I mean, because your first 10, 10 ODI innings, 17 not out, 32 not out, 65 not out, 0 not out, 31 not out, 84, 5, 45, 62 not out, 46 not out. I mean, I could go on and on, but like after 100, um, after 32 ODIs, you were averaging 100. Like this this game is easy for, for Mike Hussey, right? <laughs> no, it was never easy, that's for sure. I, I was always a pretty nervous sort of guy and so and, and very well structured and planned and organized so yeah you're, you're right I probably especially early in my career I I did map everything out how I sort of thought it would play out and um, 
Uh, and then probably as I got older and more experienced and more comfortable in, in how I wanted to play, then, then I sort of tried to let go of that as much. I still stuck to my routine, which was very important to me, but um, I sort of just tried to play more on the instinct and the situation in the game and, and just sort of let it sort of flow from there. But, uh, but yeah, I did use up a lot of mental energy uh, waiting to bat and, uh, and, and, you know, in the days leading up to games and things like that. I wish in hindsight I could just I could have learned to relax a bit more and just take a bit more pressure off myself. And your your technique is a, a really classical one. Did that change much over your career? I mean, I have to drop this in North Queensland cricket circles. Your your head lean into your shoulder as you try and line up the ball when you're batting is taught in all the camps and all of the coaching clinics. All the coaches use you as an example of the batsman to emulate when you're setting up, to, particularly if you're a left hander. To, to face fast bowling. Was your technique something you honed over the years or did it come quite naturally to you? No, I had to do a lot of work on it. I, I was very fortunate, in fact, to, to have a batting coach from uh, from about the age of 16, uh, a guy called Ian Kevin, who put in, oh, I don't know how many hours, it must have been a million hours uh, over, over the course of the, the, you know, the next decade or so. Uh, and he was fantastic. And and we did a lot of very, very basic drills, um, just making sure the head was in the right position, the shoulder that you're talking about, the uh, hands were tight to the body, the uh, the foot going to the right position, balance, and then also the bat swing coming through the line of the ball was, was very important as well. But I did have to make one pretty big change, um, and it wasn't easy. So w- when I first started, um, I used to, when I, in my stance, I'd always, um, you know, have the bat on the ground. And... You know, this Greg Chapel is big on this one as well. He said every, every batsman has to have the bat on the ground. That, that's the way you must bat. And for me personally, I, I've got quite a short body but long legs. And so if I left the bat on the ground, my head would quite often fall over towards the offside. So it was fine for playing the cover drive because I'd almost fall into the right position. But if there was a bowler that could swing the ball back in or someone bowling quite straight and attacking the stumps, I would get in myself into a lot of trouble. So I was out LBW, bowled a lot. I'd miss a lot of runs off my pads as well. So it wasn't until I got to England where I started working with um, my coach uh, there, a guy called Bob Carter, who actually lives in New Zealand now. He's still mixed up in uh, New Zealand. I think and he's actually the head coach of the, the women's team at the moment. And he suggested, why don't I stand up a little bit and, and get the bat off the ground, which was quite popular in England at the time. And it really did help me a lot. It helped me access those straighter deliveries a lot more. I was starting to hit the ball well off my pads. I just had to be a little bit more disciplined outside the off off stump there because I, I'd find it a bit more difficult to get across. And uh, so once I sort of um, yeah built that into my routine and my technique, um, I, I felt that really helped me a lot. Um, it helped me pick up the line and the length of the ball a lot quicker as well because my my eyes were level and not falling over to the offside. So once I'd sort of got that into my game and I knew it was working for me, I stuck with that for the rest of my career. Yeah, and it certainly seemed to work really well for you. That finisher role that you seem to almost make your own in ODIs has become a bit of a specialised position now. Every team wants to have one in in limited overs cricket and even in in T20 a bit. Is there a specific mindset that you need to be able to adopt to to pace an innings or pace a chase or assess, you know, what's going to be a pass score on a wicket if you're batting first? Yeah, it's a good question, and it changes all the time. I, I was always a more of a conservative sort of player, um, and, and it used to irk a few of my teammates um, because you know what they thought might be a pass score. I'd always think you know it was ten or fifteen <laughs> runs less. Um, so you know, I, I was always about you know being there at the end. That that was my goal. Just just as long as just take the game deep, just be there at the end, and and, and hopefully we can get over the line or, or get a decent score on the board. Again, as I said earlier, I was very structured uh, and planned. So, it, you know, one day cricket in particular, it, you can break it up into the different phases of the game. And so if I came in, if we were in a lot of trouble and if I came in in the first 10 overs, um, then it was all about just stabilising the innings, playing good cricket shots, uh, playing very straight. Um, once I got past that 10 over mark, sort of 10 to almost probably 35 overs, it was about getting really busy, working the ball in the gaps, running hard. Again, not looking to take too many risks, just just try and build partnerships and just be there and, and sort of do a body of the work in, in the middle overs. Once I got past the 35 over mark, probably 35 to 45, it was about getting a bit more proactive, um, you know, looking to take the odd risk, maybe use my feet to the seamers a bit more, looking to find, you know, areas where I could find boundaries and, and get a bit more creative. And then the last five overs was just obviously... 
um, pick your bowler, pick your areas and, and try and hit as many as runs as you possibly could. If it was in your slot, just go, go for it, don't hold back. If not, get bat on it and run like buggery. So I had a pretty set plan. Um, I guess the other bonus that I had, which I, I felt um, really helped me a lot, was um, you know, learning how to play spin well in England. Uh, you know, a lot of spinners getting bowled in those middle overs. So being able to rotate the strike and and run hard and, and things like that, I think really helped me. And if you've got a couple of good players at the other end, like Michael Clark was an excellent player of spin, Andrew Simons, we felt like we could really get some momentum going in those middle overs. And just on the, the ODI front, before we move on to chance cricket, how satisfying was it for you and David to be able to play international cricket together? Because you did get to play ODI cricket together, didn't you? Yeah, we played a, f- a few games together uh, and T20 games for Australia as well, which was, yeah, it was fantastic. Um, yeah, we, we, we enjoyed it. We, we're quite different in the way we go about it. He, he's, a, he's a much more talented striker of the ball than what I am. I'm more of the, the mental guy and, you know, hang in there and survive. And, but he, he was much more aggressive. So I think we actually complemented each other quite well out there in the middle. And I remember one partnership we had, which it turned out to be a match-winning partnership against New Zealand at the Adelaide Oval in a series where we'd fallen behind. I think we were 2-0 down in the series, so we had to win that game. And it gave us a lot of uh, satisfaction, and, and probably mum and dad too, watching at home, um, you know, to be out there in the middle, putting together a match-winning performance for, or partnership for Australia to help us win, win that game and get back into the series. Yeah. I mean, even after that amazing start in ODI cricket, it was a couple of years before you got your baggy green cap and, and every Australian that we have on the podcast, we have to ask them, what, what is it like being, one, finding out you're going to play test cricket for Australia, but receiving that baggy green in front of your teammates from someone who's played the game before, what's that moment like? Can you describe it or is it just one thing that only a few people get to experience and it's indescribable? No, it's, it's a roller coaster of emotions, to be honest. Uh, I, I still remember getting the call, uh, I, I was sort of back home in Perth and Justin Langer was struggling with a, a rib injury at the time. He was preparing for the test match up in Brisbane against the West Indies in 2005, November. And I was at home and, and I get the call from Trevor Holmes and he said, Huss, we need you up at the uh, up in Brisbane as quickly as you possibly can. JL is in doubt and you're on standby for him. So obviously the first uh, emotions are excitement. You know, how, how good's this? You know, and so I, I raced home, packed my bags as quick as I could, charged out to the airport and once I got to the airport, it was like I felt like a rock star, really. <laughs> there was cameras everywhere, all flashing, lights flashing. Got off to a horrible start. I lifted my suitcase up onto the uh, the, the weighing or the conveyor belt thing, and, and the zip broke, and so all my clothes just spewed out all over the floor. And so that was a bit of a, bit of a dodgy start. And then I get onto the plane. I thought I can just relax now. And I was next to this guy who must have had, I don't know, 20 Scotch and Cokes or Bundaberg rum and Cokes on the way up to Brisbane and uh, he just chewed my ear off the whole way. <laughs> but then I got, got to Brizzy and, and the team were having a team barbecue at the hotel and I walked in there and I was probably stinking of rum and Coke, but <laughs> I hadn't had a drop. Uh, but the team were fantastic. You know, they, they made me feel welcome right from the word go. They made me feel as though I deserved to be there and part of the team. And I walked over to JL and just said, mate, what's going on? And he goes, complete waste of time you being here you might as well bugger off home i'm going to be absolutely fine i'm not missing a test match for australia and he is one of the toughest guys that have played so i thought oh, it doesn't doesn't sound good for my chances but i thought i'd ask the physio as well so i had a quick chat to the physio errol alcott and he said mate prepare to play he is really struggling um so we turn up for training the next day and i'm watching jl like a hawk looking for any sort of sign of weakness or grimace of pain. And uh, he got through the fielding okay, he didn't do too much. And then we went into the nets to bat and JL was batting and he batted like a dream. He was playing cover drives and cut shots, pull shots, the whole lot. And I thought, oh, bugger, <laughs> my chance. I'm going to miss my chance again. Um, but then he came out of the net and I was walking in the net. And um, he said, Huss, I'm out, mate. You're in, good luck. That's all he said to me. And that's when... It was like, whoa, so these emotions just start to really start to well up. And uh, I think I got out the, the first five balls that I faced, I got out five, five times in a row. <laughs> and, and then I said to myself, right, come on, you've got to switch on, you've got to concentrate, you've got to prepare to play a test match. Uh, I slept okay. And then, you know, the night before the game, turned up at the game, um, feeling great, feeling excited, feeling happy. 
looking forward to the challenge, um, everything. I got presented my cap from um, Bill Brown, who, who at that time was 95 years of age, the oldest living Australian player, uh, test cricketer. And, uh, you know, he spoke some really nice words. And, and I just felt like, uh, you know, cloud, cloud nine, I was feeling great. Um, but then Ricky went out to do the toss. And uh, that's when things started to change. He won the toss. We we're going to be batting. And in half an hour, I was going to be opening the batting with Matty Hayden, you know, my first test match for Australia. And, and that's when the realisation really kicked in, thinking, you know, OK, this is, going to be, this is actually happening now. The, the butterflies kicked in, the nerves. Uh, we, we, we all lined up to do the national anthem in front of the crowd. And about halfway through the national anthem, I lost all feeling in my legs. Uh, so I thought, I'm in a bit of trouble here raced off, got my pads on, went to the toilet for about the 35th time, um, you know, for the nervous wee. And uh, in in the toilet was just Shane Warne and he just had his little underpants on. He was smoking a cigarette and he could see how nervous I was. And he just, he just said, look, Huss, I know you're nervous, but look, you've got nothing to prove to anyone in this dressing room. Just go out there, play your way and you cannot fail. And I thought, wow, that's pretty awesome from someone like Warney to, to say that to a new player. But it didn't help my my butterflies and nerves and lack of feeling in my legs. So uh, I, I I remember being out there and and look, I'll be the first to admit I did not handle the emotion well at all. Um, my mind was all over the place. So I, I I played a shocking shot, played a pull shot, went straight up in the air and got out for one in my first innings and and was devastated. But um, yeah, it was just an absolute roller coaster of emotions all the way through. But uh, I wouldn't have had it any other way. Well, it's hard to follow that story, but we were, we were trying to, in our prep and, and our research for the podcast, we were trying to find individual highlights of Mike Hussey's test career. And when you average 120, 55, 64, 80 and 91 and 149 in your first six series at test cricket, it, it, it's hard to find individual highlights. But we wanted to touch on your 195 in the 2010-11 Ashes test in Brisbane. That was one that really stood out not least because I was there for it, but that was really emotional time for you. And, and I remember you, you really let loose when you celebrated that 100. That was, that was kind of the highest of the highs for you, but it could have been pretty close to being the lowest of the lows, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's a good, good story, a good, good example, really. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a fair bit that sort of goes on in the lead-up to, to that innings, uh, and that, that's why it meant so much to me, I, I guess. Um, once you get to, I guess, having an age of three in front of your name, uh, in front of, in front of, you know, thirty something, everyone starts talking about, you know, oh, he's too old. We've got to look past. We've got to look to the the future. Blah blah blah. And, you know, coming in, it seemed like coming into every Australian summer that that seemed to be the the, the narrative. And um, we had a we had two Sheffield Shield matches leading into the uh, the Ashes series, which was going to be a massive series. Um, there's always a lot of hype involved with an Ashes series. We went, I went to Adelaide. Um, I got zero and one in that Sheffield Shield match. And then I came to Melbourne for another Shield game and I got a duck in the first innings. And, and at that stage, I was feeling pretty low. Um, there, was a, there was an Australia A game going on down in um, Hobart at the same time. And, and, I, and we had it on in the dressing room for some reason. We normally don't have the, the commentators talking, but for, for this particular day, Michael Slater was talking. He said, well, Hussey's got to go. We've got to get Kawaja in or Ferguson. We've got to, you know, blood some new guys in here. Hussey's passed it. He's got to go. And, oh, you know, it made me angry, obviously. Um, and I remember being at, home, or at the hotel that night in Melbourne and, and I rang home and I just said to my wife, I said, what, what do you reckon? Is this worth it? Like, I, I don't know if I can still do this. Do you, reckon, do you reckon I can still do this? And she was steadfast. She said, you can, you've still got it. You can still do it. Just, just put all that stuff aside and just go out there and do what you do best. And I was like, oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> and, and luckily enough for me, in the second innings in Melbourne, I managed to uh, get a good score, um, got 100, and um, thankfully the, the selectors showed faith in me. The, the funny thing was I actually felt like I was batting well during that time, but I just found ways of getting out. And um, we get up to Brisbane for the, the preparation phase leading into that first uh, Ashes Test match, and I felt good. I felt really good in my preparation. Everything went smoothly. And, and I still had uh, Michael Slater's words stinging in my ears. So I, I, I came out to bat. And it's just amazing how this game, it's like sliding doors moments. It, it's, and it's a game of millimetres. So the very first ball that I faced off Stephen Finn, 
I went for a, a drive, um, I nicked it, and it literally landed millimetres in front of second slip where Graham Swan could have taken the catch. I could have been out for a first ball duck, um, but thankfully for me, it fell just short. Um, and, and I must admit, every single ball during that innings, and, and for the series for that matter, every time I tapped my bat, I said, stuff you, Michael Slater. <laughs> so I was pretty determined to do well. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I, thankfully I was able to get a good score and, um, and, and, yeah, I guess, you know, keep the wolves at bay for a, for, for a little while anyway. We'll come on to it a, a little bit later when we talk about some of the commentary and punditry work that you do. But have, has that affected you, what, what Slater said at that point in the way that you go about TV? Uh, not really. I, I, as a commentator, I try and put myself back into the player's shoes. It, it's such an easy game from up there in, in the air conditioned box. It seems like it happens all so slowly, but out in the middle, it, it's a tough game. You know, when you can see the ball just moving a little bit on TV, as a batsman at the other end, it actually feels like it's moving you know, a, a long way. So I'm always trying to um, take it from a player's point of view and, and, uh, and try and understand what they must be thinking about at, at that stage. In the same breath, you need to call it as you see it. And if, if they are making poor decisions, you, you need to call them out on it. Um, and that's not to say that I, I made plenty of poor decisions as well and, uh, and expected to be called out on them myself. But I just try and be empathetic to, to the players out in the middle. Hey, Mike, it's, it's been great listening into this uh, as, as someone who spent my most of my career as a, a tail ender. But, um, you know, thinking about your test highlights, I had to, I, I want to know what, what your memories are of that massive partnership with Jason Gillespie. I mean, I, you, tail enders just love getting runs. I, I'm sure um, as a, you would have loved getting your, your test wickets, but um, I'd love to hear about how that partnership developed and, and I guess what you guys were talking about in the middle there. Yeah, great memories again. Um, well, I think it mainly came from Dizzy. He, he actually ran Ricky Ponting out. Uh, who Ricky was on 50 at the time on, honestly, the flattest batting pitch in the whole wide world. And Jason Gillespie was too scared to get out to go back into the dressing room to face Ricky Ponting. So I, I think that was his motivation to stay out there for so long. But Dizzy, Dizzy was absolutely hilarious out, out there in the middle. He, he did show a great technique great temperament and great courage to be able to hang in there for so long in, in very hot conditions. But as he, you know, got his confidence up and was, you know, past 100, he started to tick off all of, you know, the great Australian players as he passed their highest test score. So, you know, he'd pass Mark Ward and he'd go, oh, yeah, I've just passed, passed Junior. You know, I'm, I'm looking for Damien Martin now. Oh, yeah, I've just gone past Damien Martin. And then I've just gone past someone else. And, you know, the arrogance of the man out in the middle is just absolutely <laughs> hilarious. Um, you know, but it was a fantastic innings. And, and what I love most, he was desperate, desperate to pass Steve Waugh. And uh, Ricky Ponting declared on him, I think, one run short of, uh, oh. of Steve uh -huh. Waugh's <laughs> innings. <laughs> so uh, it offered us a lot of humour. But, uh, yeah, what a fantastic innings. That, that's pretty good recollection of everyone else's high scores. That's, that's impressive. Is, is he quite a stats man? Well, I, I didn't think he was, you know, to be honest. But obviously, he must have been doing his homework. And uh, once he got into his innings, he, he was very keen to tick them all off. Um, <laughs> and, and I think there was a message, because he played with a lot of them as well. So he was sending messages back to them as well, saying, oh, yeah, I've got you covered. So, yeah, he's, he's a funny man, Dizzy. He's got a good sense of humour. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a good, well, it was a great, great time. And, I mean, yeah, we could go on and on about uh, all your test innings. But, I mean, are, are there any that stand out to you above the rest? Uh, well, there's, there's a couple, I guess. Um, I, I had a, 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 a partnership with um, Glenn McGrath at the MCG against South Africa. Um, uh, we put on 122 for the last wicket. And just, just to be able to play, at that stage, it was the first year of my test career. Um, and to play a Boxing Day test was a childhood dream. You know, I, I used to base my, my whole training around playing a Boxing Day test, running up sand hills, running, you know, you know, as much as we could, you know, hard training was like, come on, this is to play a Boxing Day test, keep pushing. So to actually go there and play one was a, you know, dream come true. But then just to be able to play when we're nine down with just complete gay abandon <laughs> and just trying to frustrate the opposition as much as we possibly could, um, to have Glenn at the other end, who's, you know, a hero of mine as well, um, showing so much courage and, and wanting to hang in there and, um, and, and showing a lot of resilience was, was brilliant as well. So, so that's something that really stands out to me. But, but the one that stands out the most um, was an Ashes, Ashes game in Adelaide. 
um, where it, the game is now called Amazing Adelaide. Coming into the last day, no one expected a result. Everyone was expecting a draw. I was expecting a draw. And um, we managed to bowl England out and then had to chase down 160-odd, I think, in the last session. And to be out there, to hit those winning runs, you know, in Adelaide, um, still to this day is the best feeling I've ever had on a cricket field. Um, I didn't get 100 or anything like that, but but just, you know, the the, the, the crowd, the, the build-up of the crowd and the amount of noise they were making, to see the look on the face of my teammates, to see the look on the faces of England, <laughs> uh, it was just, you know, an unbelievable experience and, and yeah, something I'll, I'll never forget. Yeah, c- conversely, one of my worst cricketing <laughs> memories. <laughs> And I mean, you've you've been part of some famous Australian Test victories. That one's probably ranked highly amongst them. Can you take, take us inside the Australian dressing room after a Test win? I mean, what 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 happens? Do you sing the team song straight away? Do you all sort of relax and unwind for twenty minutes? Do you pour beer over the baggy green? What what sort of what sort of happens post Test win inside the Aussie dressing room? If you don't mind sharing. Sure, sure. Uh, it, it, it varies a lot. Um, so the, the leader of the team song virtually takes control of the team. Um, so Ricky Ponting was the captain throughout my whole career. Um, but as soon as that game finished, then Justin Langer, who was the team song master, I guess, he takes control of the team and he chooses when the time is right. So sometimes if the emotion's really high, he might um, get us all in the huddle and, uh, and we'll sing the song straight away. Other times we might have to... Uh, just sort of sit there and enjoy each other's company for sometimes four or five hours <laughs> before uh, choosing the right time to uh, to t- sing the team song. So uh, it varied a lot. Um, it's it's why a lot of us played the game, to be honest. You know that 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 time together in the dressing room, that camaraderie that was built up, the pressure was off. You know the true personalities of the players could come out. It, you know that that's what I loved most about playing Test cricket. Uh, we had some wonderful times singing the team song. Uh, I'm trying to think of a couple. Uh, if I think of New Zealand, it was actually a one-day series um, and Adam Gilchrist was leading the team song and we'd, we'd um, finished in Auckland and it was the old ground when they had the terraces there and, and you know, traditionally we copped that much stick uh, from people in those terraces. I think Michael Bevan actually had a whole chicken thrown at him once uh, uh, from, from down up there. And, and, and um, so anyway, we won this game. We stayed in the dressing room for hours and hours and Adam Gilchrist said, right, get some shoes on at about 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night and said, right, we're going up into the terrace. And, and uh, we stood up there and Gilly sort of gave this big emotional speech about the amount of abuse we'd copped from the terraces up here and, and how we stuck it up the Kiwis and, uh, and, and won a fantastic series and, and belted out the team song there. So that, that was a great experience. I remember going up into the scoreboard in, in, at the Adelaide Oval, the old famous scoreboard there and singing a team song up there. I remember in Gaul in Sri Lanka, going up to the fort that's behind the ground there and, and, and singing a team song together up there. There, there was one in South Africa uh, where uh, the team went up to uh, at Cape Town. The team went up on top of uh, Table Mountain and, and had a team song up there. So it's not just in the dressing rooms. Sometimes it might be at a, uh, you know, somewhere outside. So it's a, it's, it's a fantastic experience and um, I loved every minute of that. There's been a few conversations recently on what the baggy green means to, to different Australian cricketers. What does the baggy green mean to Mike Hussey? Uh, it means it, it's it's such a long journey, I guess, to get there, to get a hold of a baggy green cap. So so I think that's what's so meaningful for me. It's, it's not just a cap or a bit of uh, fabric. It, it's also it's the whole journey of getting up to receiving it. And then once you've got it, it's the responsibility that you have in wearing it um, in, in the manner that you play the game, in the pride that you wear it, in having to give 100% at all times um, and to, to wearing it, I guess, wearing it with honour and, and doing it justice because you do join a, a very uh, select or elite group of players that have been able to wear it. I think, I'm not sure how many there are now, but it's probably about 450 players that have worn the baggy green cap in the history of our of our country. So, that, that responsibility really, well, means a lot to me. Uh, and, and so I wanted to make sure that um, I played the game with enormous passion, enormous pride, uh, giving 100% at all times. Um, because I, I was representing, you know, myself and my family, but I, I also felt the responsibility of representing the whole country. Uh, and, and I took that very seriously. And so I, I wanted the whole country to be proud of the way I played and, and certainly the way my teammates played. If getting that 
cap is, I guess, the pinnacle as an Australian cricketer. Is the contest that's the pinnacle, the Ashes? Yeah, yeah, certainly. And, and again, I talked about the Boxing Day test being a dream. Um, as a kid growing up, I, I was desperate to play in an Ashes series. And, and funny enough, particularly to play in an Ashes series in England. Um, you know, I, I, some of my great childhood memories was watching, um, you know, staying up late with my mum and dad and watching, um, you know, the, the Ashes test matches over there in England and just thinking, wow, how good would it be to, to actually be there? And and funny enough, Michael Slater, he was the one that that really sparked my my, my dreams as well. Um, watching him score his first test century at Lords when he clipped that ball off his off his pads down to fine leg, um, and the emotion that came out of his body, you know, I, I felt the goosebumps, you know, as as a teenager there, um, watching that moment, and I thought, wow, you know, that that's something that I'd love to experience as well one day. So um, it's ironic how it works out that my, Michael Slater motivated me in in, in a couple of different ways. <laughs> And I guess with the advent of a lot of limited overs cricket, particularly the T20 stuff and franchise stuff now, how do you think it's going to play out for other nations to replicate the level of excitement for a marquee test series? It seems as if there's only a few that have got that, you know, protected status now that are going to be long series and, you know, coveted for broadcast rights and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a good question. And, and to be honest, I don't know what the future holds. Um, I, I know the boards uh, are focusing more on the dollars and cents, but I, I do believe the players have a huge role to play in this. Uh, if the players really value Test cricket, then I think they can keep it alive. Uh, and, and I've been really encouraged by someone like Virat Kohli, who, who is, is very outspoken about the importance of Test match cricket and how... Um, you know how important it is in in for the history of the game, but also for for the players moving forward to to stay stay in love and stay involved. You know in in promoting Test match cricket. I know in Australia and England, obviously two countries that are very um, traditionally uh, sound in Test cricket as well. We'll we'll keep trying to push it as well. And 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 I guess fortunately the boards will support it for Australia and England because I'm I'm sure they're still making plenty of money from those Ashes series. So. Um, yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting to see how it goes in the future. I, I actually one to, uh, once was you know uh, invited to sit in a, a New Zealand brains trust about the future of New Zealand cricket and, and what they wanted to focus on. Obviously, being a smaller country with a smaller population, they were asking questions like you know are we able to compete in all three formats of the game or should we be focusing a lot more of our attention and efforts into one format of the game? whether that be T20 cricket, 50 over cricket or test cricket. And so I'm sure it's not just New Zealand that are having these uh, discussions. Um, um, but, you know, uh, so, so, so I guess the short answer is I don't know what the future holds, but, but I really hope that test cricket has a great future ahead. But I, I do think that the players have a huge responsibility in, um, in keeping, that, keeping it alive. In that context, then, what do you make of the test championship? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, actually. I, I, I like the idea in, in that it's going to give more context to games. Like that. I think that's certainly been a, um, a bit of a bugbear that's, you know, some test matches or even one day games for that, for that matter. You know, it's like, well, what, what's the, what's the real point of this? You know, are we just, is this just to make some money or is this, you know, has it got any context into anything? So, so by having a test championship, um, I think it does give give more uh, context to Test match cricket. However, I still do think that there's going to have to be I don't know it's going to have to be worked out as the years go on because it doesn't seem like it's a level playing field at the moment. Um, you know, I, I, I I'm not 100 percent across at all, but it seemed as though India had a dream run playing a lot of Test matches at home against probably a slightly weaker opposition, built up a lot of points early in the in the Test match championship, and it's going to be very difficult for anyone else to to chase them down. Now, I just want it to be fair uh, for everyone to have a chance so the best performed team can win the uh, Test Championship. And I'm not saying India aren't the best performed team because they are an outstanding Test match team and, and probably do deserve to be right up there. But I felt as though a fair few teams around the world were playing catch up in, in, you know, in the first bit. And I mean, Mike, you, you touched on the uh, sort of New Zealand cricket and, and what we focus on. And uh, I mean, it feels like for for me as a fan, the World Cup is definitely our sort of four year cycle. We we work towards those. That you touched on a little bit before, but those those test series, it's really hard for us. I mean, Australia is kind of always the one we want to go win in Australia, but unfortunately, we always go there and seem to get pumped. But 
Um, I mean, for you, compared to an Ashes, you won the World Cup in 2007. Where does that kind of stack up as a career highlight? Yeah, that's that's right up there as well. Um, yeah, uh, the Ashes series uh, and World Cups are, are probably the two highlights of any Australian player at the time. Um, I, I think from a World Cup perspective, being considered the best one day team in the world uh, and, and having that respect from all the other countries and, and your peers, I guess, is something that, that I, I really love. Uh, and, and I do remember that campaign in the West Indies so clearly. It was unbelievable. The, the way that team prepared and executed uh, on, on game day was just unbelievable. In fact, I'm not sure I've been part of any Australian team that has executed so well on a consistent basis. Uh, from that uh, than that particular trip, it was just an incredible tournament, and we certainly didn't have it all our own way. You know, we lost Brett Lee in a series in New Zealand, uh, literally right before the World Cup, who was obviously our spearhead mm. and and key key bowler. I think he was one of the best one day bowlers in the world at that stage. So we lost him early on. We had Andrew Simons was injured; he missed the first three or four games. Who was a critical player in our team as well, but it was just such a a great great team. We still had great players like Glenn McGrath and Matthew Hayden had a series out of this world. We had Ricky Ponning and Adam Gilchrist, but we also had some magnificent unsung heroes as well. Guys like Nathan Bracken and Brad Hogg that played significant roles throughout that series. So, we, and, and even Sean Tate, who replaced uh, Brett Lee, you know, played brilliantly. And, and so it, we didn't just rely on our stars, but we, we also relied on, on everyone else chipping in along the way. So it was a fantastic trip and, and certainly gives me enormous pride in being part of it. You touched on Brad Hogg there. Is he as much of a character as as he comes across? Pest is probably a better word to uh, describe Brad <laughs> Hogg. Uh, <laughs> I know Hoggy really well. We came from WA together. And, and in fact, my very first Sheffield Shield game, uh, I roomed with Brad Hogg. And to give you an indication about what this guy is like, I was awoken at five in the morning to a naked Brad Hogg bowling <laughs> a cricket ball against the hotel wall uh, in preparation for the Sheffield Shield game. So... Um, that that sort of gives you a bit of an insight about what Hoggy's like, and uh, yeah, Pest uh, is is probably uh, the best way to describe him, and he could be the butt of so many great jokes along the way as well. So, yeah, he, he's a fan. He, he is a fantastic character, and he, he was a fantastic cricketer as well, particularly in the short form of the game, instrumental in helping Australia win not only that World Cup in two thousand and seven, but I think also in two thousand and three in South Africa when Warney got uh, suspended. Mm. Oh, look, as someone who's never met Brad at all, that, that doesn't surprise me, that story, uh, just from, from watching him play. And um, But you're spot on. He had a really impressive uh, impressive career. But I, I guess on the on the flip side, um, what, what was Ricky Ponting like as a leader? I mean, people looked at that team. You touched on all the amazing players, Warren, McGrath, Gilchrist. And sometimes from the outside, it's really hard to know how much success to kind of attribute to the captain when the side just looks so awesome on paper. Yeah, Ricky was a, a fantastic captain, uh, and yes, okay, I, I hear what you're saying that you know he had a fair arsenal at his uh, disposal, particularly when Warren and McGrath were playing. But the thing about Ricky was he his standards that he set for training uh, were just unbelievable, and he led that. If, even if it's a fielding drill he, uh, at training, he, he would want to be the best, and you have to try and you know try and get up to his sort of standard and levels. He would really drag the standards up, um, but by everyone. But he also backed his players in 100%. So even if you were going through a bit of a rough patch, there was a bit of outside talk about your place in the team, nah, Ricky was in there batting for you with the selectors. You, you could honestly really feel that he wanted you in the team. He valued you as an you know, important member of the, member of the team. And, um, and, and that you, you want to follow guys like that. You know if you've got his backing, you want to give your best to, to that guy as well. He, he was in such an incredibly competitive guy. Uh, sometimes I, I, I think he probably went over the over the top with the competitiveness and uh, his will to win um, pro- probably got up close to the line. Um, but you know you could never question his uh, his commitment to to for Australia winning games of cricket. And we'll move to the the IPL. I mean, as a player. How, how does it stack up to some of the achievements at the international level? I know you won the, the tournament. Uh, twice, I think, in, in 2010 and 2011. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I, I was very lucky uh, to, to join the Chennai Super Kings. It's a, it's an unbelievable franchise. I, I, I love the IPL. I know when it very first started, there was a little bit of negativity around it and uh, and a bit of uncertainty about how it was going to play out. But 
being able to go into a, a dressing room with players that I admired from all around the world and to learn off each other and to bounce off ideas um, was, was just absolutely incredible. But, you know, talking to the Indian players about how to play spin in India, to watch how MS Dhoni goes about the finishing role that he plays, to be able to talk to Dwayne Bravo about, bowl, you know, bowling at the death, mm. um, Albie Morkel, you know, his, his power hitting towards the end of a, a game, um, building relationships with, uh, with Indian players who, who were literally scared of Australians. I, I remember the first day we walked in, I, I, well, I walked in with Matty Hayden and Matty Hayden had this reputation of being this big, bad, ugly ogre you know, aggressive and nasty. <laughs> and and I knew that he wasn't that guy. <laughs> he could be on the field. But we walked into the Chennai dressing room and, and I could see these young Indians just cowering into the corner, you know, just not wanting to make eye contact with Matty Hayden. Mm. And Haydos walks in and goes, G'day, boys, Matty Hayden from Australia. Nice to meet you. Yeah, great. And, and the look of surprise on these guys' faces was just a sight to see. Uh, and they realised that, you know, this Matty Hayden's actually a great guy and uh, and they learn a lot off him as well as him learning a lot off them. So it broke down a few of those cultural barriers, I think. And, and maybe um, Australia lost a bit of aura, uh, you know, the, the aura around the Australian team that we did have. And, and we quite often would beat teams just because they were intimidated by the Australian team. But once the IPL came along and they got to know a lot of the Aussie players as people and that we weren't, you know, these nasty people that uh, we're, we're, you know, p uh, the perception was we were, then um, I think that, you know, that sort of did break down a few of those cultural barriers. Yeah, I mean, to follow on from that, is it is it harder to play against sides once you know who they are and who they are as people? Not really. Uh, I, I, I never sort of worried about it. It was just a contest between bat and ball for me and the situation mm. of the game and, and trying to win, win that game. I, I'm sure there was others that, certainly do, do feel that and might, might, might need that confrontation. Um, but I certainly wasn't someone that went looking for a confrontation with an opposition player. In fact, I was probably the opposite. I probably tried to shy away from a confrontation. I, I just wanted to stay in my little bubble and just, just focus on what my job was in the team. And, and now that you're back at CSK with, as the batting coach, what, what does that role entail? Because, I mean, I guess you've only got players for a short space of time. How, how much is it sort of technique? How much is mindset, game plan... Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, uh, and I pro it'll probably change depending on, on what type of team we have. But, again, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be here, and I feel very grateful to be here in a coaching capacity. And our team is so experienced. I, I think we must be the oldest T20 team ever assembled. <laughs> I think the average age of it is about 35 or 36 years of age. Uh, that's probably not exactly right, but it feels like that. So, so w with that experience comes guys that know their games inside and out. So... We very rarely talk about technique. Um, it's it's all about sort of mindset, uh, and, and then probably a bit of tactical play as well. But it's a it's about creating an environment where the guys can just feel feel good, feel comfortable, feel great about their games, and to be able to just go out there and, and play their their way, uh, and try and keep them in that frame of mind. They they all they've all been in every pressure situation ever known to man on a cricket field. So. Um, you know, that they know how to handle the different the different situations in game. It's just about them being in the right frame of mind to, to be able to go out there and play their best cricket. You touched a little bit upon that aura, I guess, of the Australians coming into the IPL. And I, I guess really keen to understand at CSK and, and in the IPL, how much will the players share? Because you're going to come up against these guys on the international circuit two or three months later. You don't necessarily want to be saying, you know, when I'm going to bowl my slower ball, you know, this is how I do it or, you know, to let those sort of technical secrets. But you've got a game to win. How do you sort of foster that, that you know, that sharing within within a group of players that are going to probably want to hide some stuff from each other? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. This is something that's really surprised me, actually. Uh, I think coming into the IPL, I thought that it'd be exactly that. Players would be sort of just, just holding a little bit back, but it's completely the opposite. <laughs> Whenever we're talking about, you know, uh, a player, not, not me, so say we're, we've got a player in our team, uh, Mitch Santner, for example, is with the CSK team. And um, I don't know, Kane Williamson comes up for um, the uh, Sunrisers Hyderabad. Now, he's, he's telling us everything. <laughs> And, uh, and, 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 and look, I'm not saying Mitch Santner in particular, but I'm saying any of the guys. They're, they're more than willing to, to come out and, and try and help the team um, get the result we're after. It, yeah, I, I don't know if that happens in, in all teams, but, but certainly I was surprised that um, 
everyone sort of gets invested in, in, in the team and, and the Chennai Super Kings team and, and wants the team to have success uh, and are more than willing to uh, open up about their, uh, about their comrades from, from their country. <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not to say that, you know, they're definitely not going to score runs or take wickets, but, but yeah, I, I must admit I was a little bit surprised at how willing they were to open up. And, I mean, you touched on New Zealand there. What's it like working with Stephen Fleming? I mean, we here view him as someone with a really great cricket brain. I imagine the conversations between you two must be pretty good. Oh, it's fantastic. And and more around the environment that he creates, um, keeping a – I think especially in India where, where cricket is like a religion and, and people take it so seriously and, and the, 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 the stress levels raise and then the pressure builds up and – Stephen Fleming and, and his relationship with MS Dhoni is just uh, pivotal in, in the success of CSK. They, they have this great ability to help everyone to relax, to take pressure off players, to not chop and change the team very much, you know, to, to show a lot of faith and backing in players. Um, and, and just a shrewd, shrewd in the way they go about it. They, 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 they don't make any rash decisions. Uh, and, and, and I look at great leaders that I've sort of seen, and, and I put both those guys in, uh, in that category, that they don't get if, if we're doing really well they don't get too high if we're doing poorly as a team they don't get too low they're very consistent characters and uh and and something i certainly admire about both flam and uh and msd as well has he has he ever lost it in the dressing room i just cannot picture stephen fleming screaming at someone i can only think of maybe once or twice uh that that he has actually had some pretty stern words to the boys and and he can use that to his advantage because normally he's such a, a calm, mild-mannered guy that when he does sort of uh, lose it a little bit, then everyone sort of sits down and listens because you think, wow, this doesn't happen very often. He, he must be serious here. And, and the same with MS. I've literally seen MS lose his temper probably twice in 11 years of being involved with CSK. Uh, and, and so, um, yeah, it has an impact when it happens, but it's very, very rare indeed. And I mean, it'd be remiss of us to to not explore MS a little bit more now that uh, he's in, announced his international retirement. I guess you touched on a little bit before about the aura and and things, but what's it like to be around him in India? <laughs> you can't get near him in India. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's normally surrounded by thousands and thousands of people. Uh, mm. I, again, what what I admire about him so much is just how calm and level headed he is. You know. He, Literally, this guy, his life is in a hotel room, at a cricket ground, or doing um, advertisement shoots. That, that, that's basically his life. <laughs> and mm-hmm. whenever he's sort of at an airport, he just gets mobbed. But he, he's got very little ego. He, he almost he doesn't get caught up in the hype of being a megastar or, or um, he doesn't get a, even just doesn't get caught up in the hype of a game of cricket. It's just a game of cricket. And I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, I remember playing a game. It was, a, it was Chennai Super Kings versus the Royal Challengers Bangalore, and and they're our local rivals. So it's it's a huge build up. The crowd at, at uh, Chepok in Chennai is absolutely pumping, and and the game's about to start. And we come in for our little huddle. And for me personally, I think those little huddles are the biggest waste of time. Of you know, and, and it's just a complete load of rubbish because. I don't even remember what even gets said in those. It's normally the biggest load of rubbish that gets spoken in there anyway. But I remember one conversation that's ever happened in those huddles, and that was from MSD in this particular match. So picture picture this, a massive stadium, crowd roaring, um, huge expectation in the game. MSD pulls us all in really tight, and he says, okay, guys, now the Spirit of Cricket Award is very important to me, okay? So I want you guys to go out there and play the game hard, but play it fair. If, if you get a bad decision, don't argue with the umpire. Just walk straight off. If you think you've got someone out, I don't want to see any dissent. I want you to go back to your mark and just, just get on with the game. You know, just guys, just go out there, enjoy the game, smile at the crowd. If we win, we win. If we lose, we lose. It doesn't really matter. And that was the, that was the, the huddle speech. And I thought, what a load of rubbish. No, I want to win. Let's get into this game, you know. But after the game, in thinking about it, I thought he's got this amazing ability just to be able to take pressure off players, just to relax, enjoy the game, play the game. That's when you play your best cricket. It was a huge game, a huge occasion. And you could see the Indians were so pepped up and they wanted to do so well, but he just had this ability just to relax them. Don't worry about it. Just don't worry about the result. 
just you're at your best when you're relaxed and playing and, and just enjoying the game. And, and so for him to have that, I guess, uh, mental ability or, the, or the, um, the, the shrewdness to be able to convey that to players was just absolutely incredible. And, and you used to see that in, in decisions he'd make on the field. You know, he'd go with his gut and, and you'd, you'd be watching and you're thinking, what on earth is he doing? You know, why is he bowling this guy? But invariably it'd work. Um, and he'd come out on top. You just, you just sort of marvel at the guy and the way he goes about it and the way he thinks about the game. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's someone as a, always in the opposition, if he was at the crease, you always thought that, that India was going to win. But he, <laughs> did, do you, I mean, you're around the game a lot still. Do you miss being out there under the bright lights? No, quite the opposite, actually. I, don't, <laughs> I do not miss it at all. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, as I said earlier, I was I was a bit of a stress pot and uh, very intense and you know anxious and nervous and so I don't miss that side of the game whatsoever. Uh, I I miss a little bit of the contest in the middle, you know, and, and winning the battle. Uh, I, I do miss a bit of that, but I, I love being the co- uh, a coach and and uh, doing the preparation work, all the hard work behind the scenes, and helping a player, you know, try and reach his potential, uh, and then watching that player go out there and perform gives me enormous pride. Uh, and and also, once that game starts, I honestly feel no, no nerves whatsoever. There's there's nothing more I can do as a as a coach. I can just enjoy, sit back and enjoy and watch the game. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying that part of it now. So, Lippy mentioned the, the bright lights there. You're also under the bright lights in the commentary box. And I guess th- that must have been pretty tough taking over from Channel 9. And we would we've discussed this quite a lot. We we love Howie and you know the way that he brings that coverage together. It's a really really good broadcast product. I, I want to know something a bit geeky. Um, <laughs> how does all the tech work? Do, are you noticing stuff and then you kind of ask for those beehives, those pitch maps, all that kind of stuff, or do they feed you things that you're going to focus on when you're in that you know technical zone up against the green screen? It's a bit of a two way street, really. Uh, so the, the, the technical gurus behind the camera are unbelievable in, in some of the stuff they come up with and what they can do. Uh, and they make me in front of the camera look way better than what I actually am. Um, and, and they're always looking for things in the game, but I guess their eye isn't as trained um, as much. So they're always asking me, what are you seeing out there? Um, is, there some, is there something we can you know, build, build a package around that you're seeing that you, know, that you find interesting out in the middle? Um, quite often there's there's nothing, but uh, and, and they they'll they'll sort of come up with something. But but quite often there's little intricacies in the game that I can take to them, and then they can build a lot of footage and stats and and things around that. And uh, it just seems to be getting better and better every year. Um, so I I quite enjoy it. I must admit I do get a bit nervous behind there trying to you know play it all out, and we need a few rehearsals along the way. Uh, but but when it comes together, and you sit back and watch it afterwards, and you think, wow. You guys behind the scenes are just phenomenal in what you can put together. Yeah. And what, um, I guess, sort of rolling forward a little bit, you're obviously involved in the coaching piece, the media piece. Do you have a preference for, you know, what's going to take precedence as you, as you move forward? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I guess when I finished playing, I didn't really know what I wanted to go into. So I wanted to keep my options open. I, I, I wanted to try a bit of everything. I wanted to try some coaching I wanted to try some media stuff. I wanted to try some cricket administration. I wanted to try some things completely away from the game altogether. And I still don't know <laughs> what I want to do exactly. I, I'm enjoying – I think if, I, if I'm being completely honest with you, my, my heart tells me I, like, I love coaching. Um, however, what I, what I love at the moment is the balance in my life. Uh, when I was a player, I had no balance whatsoever. I was pretty much on the road 10 months of the year. If I become a full-time coach, I'm going to go back into that horrible uh, work-life balance of, uh, of being away too much from home. At the moment, I can, I can do some coaching, so say with the IPL, for two or three months of the year. Uh, I can do some Fox commentary as well for, for two or three months of the year. And then I've got the rest of the year to basically pick and choose, do whatever I'd, I'd like to do around that. It might be some more coaching. It might be some administration. It might be absolutely nothing, just having time with family. So I love having the balance to be able to do both. I think they, some people will argue, say, well, no, you've got to, you've got to choose. You know, if you're going to be the best coach in the world, you've got to be a full-time coach. If you want to be the best commentator in the world, you've got to you know, really work on your craft in there. 
and, and I hear that argument and, and I probably do agree in, in, a, in a certain extent. But however, I, I also believe they can, can work hand in hand. By being a coach, I think that can help my commentary because I'm in the inner sanctum. I'm seeing the trends of the game and I'm, I'm hearing what the players are talking about, seeing how they're going about it from very close quarters. Um, but also from a commentary side of things with the technology these days, I think what those guys are, are bringing to the table is incredible. And I can take that into a coaching sense as well. Plus, you get a, such a great picture of the game from up there as well. So I do believe they can work hand in hand. Um, and I'm going to try and um, maybe just <laughs> stay, stay, uh, stay as balanced as I can for as long as I can. Yeah, one of the really interesting pieces that you worked on was that analysis you did on the on the culture and, and structure in South Australian cricket. I mean, you made a number of recommendations in there, and some of them were cultural and, and some of them were structural. For you, what was the most important one to nail down to, to really kind of increase the chances of success for, for that state association? Yeah, it was a really interesting process, doing a review for uh, South Australian Cricket Association. Um, that, that They've... They're one of the founding uh, states in the Sheffield Shield uh, and, and haven't had much success over 120 or 30 years in their history. That they, They've won the odd shield here or there, but haven't been able to have a sustained period of success. And, and we're really keen to explore maybe there's some deep-seated um, sort of uh, reasons why. So it was quite broad in coming in with the process. Uh, uh, it, was, it was around culture to start with. Um, it was also around... Um, their, their systems, but also around their high performance uh, processes in place as well. So really interesting. I interviewed over well over 100 people um, from all different, from the whole spectrum of cricket, really, from the high performance, uh, from down right down to junior cricket as well, um, in South Australia, outside South Australia, or, or in all parts of the world, and got a very clear picture uh, about what is required in a state association to build something that can have sustained success. And... The thing I, I think that came out that is most important in South Australia at the moment is that the, the relationships down the pathway uh, need to be extremely strong and, and probably haven't been very strong in the last five to ten years in particular. N having a, a grade cricket or premier cricket system that is really strong, with strong relationships between the SACA and them uh, in premier cricket, and then taking it down a step further, having a really strong junior uh, system as well that feed players into premier cricket with Premier Cricket then feeding players into Sheffield Shield Cricket. Uh, and I think that's broken down quite a bit in the last probably five to ten years. There's a lot of um, distrust um, bet between the, the, the different uh, associations and, and so that really needs to be built up and, uh, and, and I guess, nurtured over the next you know, five to ten years. How likely is it, do you think, that other state associations are looking at, at that report that you did and thinking, yeah, I'm facing those same kind of challenges. Is this kind of lack of pathways or, or disassociation between kind of junior cricket and, and that top level. Do you think that's widespread in other states in Australia or indeed overseas, maybe in England and other places like that? I'm not sure overseas, but certainly in Australia. I, I, think, I think one of the big problems is we've gone away from what made us so successful. We, we'd always have the three pillars, really. Strong junior setup, a strong premier cricket setup, and then strong Sheffield Shield. And then that fed into a very strong Australian team. About probably 10, maybe 15 years ago now, we, we, we decided to go away from focusing on those pillars and, and, and bringing in more pathways, bringing in, um, you know, Cricket Australia focused on trying to set up high performance systems for under 15s, under 17s, under 19s, having carnivals and, and dragging a lot of good talent out of the premier cricket sort of system. And, and um, what, what, what that's done, I think it's proved to be a, 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 well, a big failure, really, because what that's done is it's identified talented young players, got them into high-performance programs and created a sense of entitlement. So, so these young players, they haven't dominated in the junior levels or they haven't dominated in premier cricket, but they've been promoted because they've got talent into these pathways and, and, and then they expect to be given opportunities in second 11 in Sheffield Shield cricket. And, and we sort of took our focus away from really earning your place in the team at, at a state level and going away picking youth and picking on talent when they haven't actually dominated or earned that sort of uh, right to, to play, I guess. And, and I think now things are starting to change, you know, at, at a Cricket Australia level. And it's very important that Cricket Australia, um, you know, because that, they're the ones that, you know, lead the philosophy, you know, heading down. So I think they've realised now that that model has not been successful and are, and are looking to 
go back to the old pillars of let's make Premier Cricket really strong, put a big focus on Premier Cricket and Junior Cricket as the feeder pathways into Sheffield Shield Cricket, make them really strong, make the players uh, earn their place again, um, really deserve that opportunity to play for their states. And then that'll create a, a, an environment in the Australian team where where you know you'll build you you'll have good tough resilient players that that can perform under pressure for long periods of time and and so I, I really hope that that's that's going to be the focus moving forward in, in Australia. Well, Mike, um, as three guys who have grown up, I guess, watching you, um, we're still, I think, pinching ourselves that you're sitting on our Skype screen at the moment. But before we do let you go, hopefully, we've provided a little bit of distraction from your quarantine there but we've got a quick fire round that we just want to uh, bash through before we let you go um i am going to ask you to look back on a sledge so get the get the brain ticking as to as to something that it's probably not been in one of those books of 101 great sledges we want we want something uh we want something fr from the underground first thing matter first last runs you've got which bowler did you have in your pocket whether it was in the shield or in the county championship <laughs> In my pocket. Uh, I, I didn't have any bowler in my pocket. I had a lot of bowlers that I absolutely hated facing, like Dale Stain and Murali and uh, Jimmy Anderson in England. Uh, was was pretty hard to face. Graham Swan in England as well. Uh, as far as who I'd like to face, yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't really have anyone. Um, I'll tell you I'll tell you someone that I enjoyed facing was Scotty Styrus. <laughs> With his little <laughs> slow, medium paces. He used to have it over Ricky Ponting and uh, Michael Clark. They hated facing Scotty Styrus. But for some reason, I, I don't know what it was, I quite enjoyed facing him. Uh, he used to try and bowl these little cutters all the time, just back of a length. So I used to hang back and just try and pull the living daylights out of him, and he used to annoy the living crap out of him. <laughs> Look, that's, that's awesome. I'm going to clip that into a little voice clip and text that to him because we've, uh, <laughs> we've been talking about getting him on the podcast. So he, he will want a right of reply, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so talking about these bubbles that everyone's operating in now, if you did have to room with someone, who would be your favourite teammate? Probably not Hoggy. Well, not Brad Hogg. Not Brad Hogg, that's for sure. Uh, I, I would have to say Andrew Simons. He is by far the funniest man or, or uh, funniest teammate I've ever encountered in my entire life. My only worry with being with Andrew Simons is that if he started having a cold beer, then um, he doesn't know how to stop. So I might <laughs> actually be in a coma if I try and have a few beers with Andrew Simons in the room. But uh, as far as a teammate goes, um, absolutely hilarious, great competitor, uh, fantastic guy to have around the team. And, and yeah, I'm, I'll be more than happy to room with him. No worries. So hypothetical situation that, that might come true, who knows? Your head coach of, uh, of CSK... And uh, you get you get the number one draft pick, and nobody's drafted. You can have any cricketer in the world as your number one draft pick. Who, who would you pick? Oh, it's I, I guess the name that springs to mind straight away is Rashid Khan. Um, I also played with uh, Andre Russell at um, at uh, the Sydney Thunder, and he was virtually three players in one. So I, I'd have to I'd have to toss it up between those two, uh, but but probably leaning towards Rashid Khan. What, what a player! Uh, Every team that he's involved in, he seems to continue to keep doing well. Seems like a great team man as well, can contribute with the bat. Great energy. Uh, I, I'd probably, you'd have, to, you'd have to push me pretty hard to not, go, not, not pick him with the first pick. Cool. You, you talked about some of the, the cricketing celebrations around the world, the fort at Gaul, for example, and Table Mountain. But outside of the cricket, what was the best thing you did on a cricket tour, non-cricketing experience? Uh, non-cricketing. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, I, I didn't do too much at all. <laughs> um, let me have a think about that. I, I must admit, I did really enjoy going uh, to the fort in uh, in Gaul. Uh, that that was, and it wasn't long, too long after you know the tsunami had hit, and uh, you know the, oh, that whole place had been wiped out. And hearing some of the stories there was pretty incredible. I, I'm also. Uh, a bit embarrassing to say i've got a bit of a castle fetish as well so when, when i was up in england and scotland i i tried to get to as many castles <laughs> as i possibly could so i loved edinburgh castle and uh Calane castle on the you know the west coast of scotland and 
um, Aberdeen Castle. Uh, you know, there, there's so many. Where William Wallace was in, um, uh, where was he? In, uh, I can't remember even where, where that castle was, but, uh, you know, with the Battle of Bannockburn and, and, and all that sort of, going, going to those sort of places was absolutely fantastic as well. Awesome. It's come time for the, the best sledge that you've heard on, <laughs> on a cricket field. Yeah, well, okay. Well, I can honestly say that at test match level, the, the sledging, it's it's sort of toned down quite a lot. Um, I'd say Warney was, uh, he could be pretty aggressive out there, but not a lot of, you know, intelligent sort of stuff coming out. David Warner as well wouldn't shut up. But again, not a lot of intelligent sort of stuff coming out. But the best sledging I heard was actually playing club cricket. And I was at uh, the non-striker's end. My mate was batting at the other end. And then the wicketkeeper was sort of behind him. And this wicketkeeper was just laying into my mate. Just, geez, you're ugly. You are the ugliest batsman I've ever seen in the world. If, if, if there was an ugly 11, you'd be captain of the ugly 11. And my mate turned around to the keeper and said, yeah, I've seen your missus and she's batting number three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, brilliant. <laughs> and like we, we we've uh yeah we, penultimate question a little bit of levity but we want to finish on a serious note lots and lots to come for you by the sounds of things with uh csk the, the the coaching work and media work as well but when you look back at the moment what are you proudest of uh proudest moment is probably scoring 100 in a test match for australia um uh, it, it, it's it's probably that moment. Like one, one thing to get that baggy green cap, but you want to prove to yourself and the world that you can succeed at that level as well. So 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 that moment, you know, I got one down to fine leg. Um, it was just all these emotions just pouring out of my body, but it was just inside. I felt right. I've proved to myself and the world that I can succeed at the highest level, and and that gave me enormous pr uh, pride. And then probably the other the other thing is. Being able to share a cricket field with some of the greatest players that have ever played the game and watch them in, in, you know, from very close quarters and how they go about their work uh, is something that gives me enormous pride. Playing with guys like Shane Warne, you know, Glenn McGrath, Ricky Ponting, playing against Sachin Tendulkar, um, Brian Lara, you know, it, it's, it's just unbelievable, really. And, and I have to pinch myself that I'm actually on the same cricket field as these guys, and, and I, so I feel very honoured to be able to do that. Well, you are way, way too humble because um, you certainly <laughs> deserve to be mentioned in, in that company with the, oh, the, no, the record no, no, that you've no had. Way. No way whatsoever. <laughs> Look, I, Mike, it's been absolutely awesome to, to, to chat to you. As we said, we hope we've been a little bit of a distraction from your, your quarantine there in, in Dubai. All the very best for the IPL season. We hope it goes off with as few hitches as possible, I'm sure. Um, in this current world climate, who knows what's what's around the corner? So, look, I hope you say safe with uh, with your team and and the rest of the the guys in the tournament there. But look, thank you very much for taking some time on the Top Order podcast. Uh, no worries, guys. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. And yeah, same for you guys. Stay safe and healthy. And yeah, let's hope we can all get through this okay.